Okay, well, welcome everybody. Good to see you all. Um, join me in a, in a prayer to start us off with. Uh, Lord, thank you for the, the sun that's shining outside. And thank you for the warmer temperatures that are here and warmer ones that are on their way. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that as the, as the weather lifts our spirits, uh, so would we take that, that thankfulness uh, to you as well. And we look, Lord, to your Holy Spirit this morning uh, to lift us up, uh, to draw us together, and to give us a, a heart of joy and a heart of faithfulness uh, to be found in you. And Lord, I thank you for each individual uh, who's with us today. I thank you for each person. I thank you for how you have made them. I thank you for the gifts that you've given them. And I thank you, Lord, uh, that together uh, we are your body, uh, one in mind and spirit. And I thank you, Lord, that this is your church, not my church or our church, but rather yours. And Lord, we pray that your will be done in our lives and in the life of this fellowship. And we pray that this morning would be one step deeper into your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Jean Rene, will you bless us with a song this morning? Jesus for us. We are so grateful this morning. God is turned is grateful for your faithfulness, oh Jesus. Above all powers, above all 
all kings above all nature and all created things above all wisdom and all the ways of man you were here before the world began above all kingdom above all thrones above all his word has ever known above our wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified. Let be honest on Jesus, you lived to die, rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground, you took the fall. Amen. Thank you, Sean Renee. I'm looking forward to hearing you sing again in person. <laughs> uh, on that note, I wanted to share uh, with you all um, that we are, I, I'll confirm this in an email and send out more information, but uh, we are hoping uh, to open on Easter, uh, April 5th. And uh, we'll, we'll still be doing Zoom. In fact, I imagine we'll be doing Zoom far into the future. Uh, but we will have the church building open. Um, now, it, it will be Easter, of course. Um, but I encourage you to think about this in the same way uh, that you think of getting into a very hot bathtub, uh, which is to say gingerly and slowly. Uh, we're going to be dipping our toes back into the hot water and the hot water being real life. Um, so our first Sunday together, uh, Easter, uh, will be just like it was uh, back in the fall with wearing masks uh, and not singing together, unfortunately, as much as I would love to do that on Easter. But uh, we'll have our worship leaders, uh, you know, Jean Rene or the laymans or whomever, uh, singing for us, blessing us with the song. And we'll be uh, still wearing masks and trying to keep our social distance. But it is a, a step in the right direction and uh, if hopefully, prayerfully, if the numbers can go down, then we can to ease our way uh, back to do what we do. We're you know, uh, out max and all that sort of, but we would be prudent about it and slowly into it as, as the number we, uh, well, it's on item. It's just the, the next thing on, am, am I still on? Can you see me? Oh dear. Oh, you know what? I don't think I turned my computer off in the back and I've got a bunch of windows open. Okay. Uh, Skipped over. Yes. Um, sorry, my mind is. Uh, uh, we have a psalm, uh, which I apologize, Karen. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go into the back office and try to fix this issue and while Karen does the Sunday psalm. Thank you, Karen. Good Father, sweet Jesus, Holy Spirit, we present ourselves before you again this Sunday, nearly a year into an unexpected stress test. We groan with longing, longing for an end. 
We're so grateful for vaccines and treatments, and yet we fear more deaths before this particular test is over. Consider it all joy, James says, when we encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. Trials test faith. Suffering almost by definition raises questions about your love. If you really loved me, you'd have stopped that virus before it got to my dad, wouldn't you? If you really loved me, my black son would be respected. How did you stand by when I was abused if you really loved me? In overwhelming stress, anguished cries of anger and grief pour forth. Trials test faith in your character. We need your grace to turn back toward you rather than turn our backs. Strengthen our trust, O Lord. Where else will we go? You alone are the way and the truth. There is life in no other. We will never give up seeking your face. There is always more depth in your eyes. And the best where all will be joy is yet to be. Amen. Okay. Will hear me? Oh, we're getting messages on our computer screen that the internet connection is unstable. This has happened before. Uh, so it's nothing to do with anything with our computers. It's just that we have bad internet right now at the church for whatever reason. So we may be cutting in and out. Uh, there's not much we can do about it at the moment. So I suppose we'll just say no service today because, you know, what can we do? But hopefully it'll, it'll, uh, remain. How are we doing, Elizabeth? We're doing good. Okay. Okay. All right. When you're ready, then you can come and uh, share. So Elizabeth, um, well, as you all know, uh, we all approach the Gospels differently, and every time we hear a scripture, uh, we all put it through our prism, right? Through our, our lens, through our experiences, and through our emotions, and we all hear things a little differently. Um, and uh, Elizabeth shared something with me about a passage that I had uh, preached on a little bit ago and about how she, how she heard that, how she experienced it. And I thought it was helpful and valuable and, and sort of an insightful uh, way of thinking about it. And so uh, I asked her if she would share on that um, before the sermon. So she's going to do that now, God willing, if the computers uh, cooperate. Hello, everyone. Uh, can y'all hear me? I'm not seeing any thumbs up. Yeah, okay. So you can hear me. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, I am going about mental health and self esteem. So if you aren't in a place to hear that right now, um, just hope you'll give yourself uh, the leeway to kind of step away for a few minutes. Um, while I talk about that, when you see Seth back up at the podium, you know, it'll be all good. Um, so I asked Seth if I could give this devotional um, after listening to his sermon last week. Um, one passage in particular spoke to me, um, and I'll read it here again. It's from Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. When I was working the deep nights uh, until 3 a.m. at an academic library on campus, uh, I often worked with two people in particular. Uh, one was a fellow permanent employee um, who's technically my immediate supervisor, and the other was an undergraduate student worker who often picked up those late night shifts with us. And if anyone has worked those uh, late nights uh, at a slow job, you know that the conversation can sometimes get deeper than it would in a normal job. Um, and as the resident Christian, I often had to answer any questions that they had about my faith or answer for some indiscretion of uh, someone who called themselves a follower of Jesus. Um, on this particular night, my coworkers were getting caught up in rules. Uh, what the Bible says you should and shouldn't do, what so-called followers of Jesus thought people should and shouldn't do. And I finally told them that one of the only things that Jesus actually commanded us to do is to love your neighbor as yourself. And these people, God bless them, they asked the question that I have often been asking myself. Um, it's a question that no one in the church, uh, capital C, ever seems to ask or address. And when I have had the courage to ask it, no one ever seems to answer it to my satisfaction. Love your neighbor as yourself. And they asked me, what if you don't love yourself? And I've spoken about this before, so most of you probably know that uh, I do have severe depression. Um, and it's been reasonably well managed with medication and therapy. And yet, and yet I struggle to think that I'm worthy of love. I struggle to think that I have any worth or value that is deserving of love. Sometimes I struggle to find the motivation to provide myself with basic nutrition and basic hygiene. Sometimes I struggle to find a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Sometimes I struggle to find a reason not to end my own life. Is this the love that Christ would have me provide my neighbor? Hint, the answer is no. If I had been alone when I was answering my coworkers that night, what if you don't love yourself? Then I would have failed them utterly. Because up until this point, I had never been able to answer that question for myself. But when they asked me, I felt the Holy Spirit move in me. And with certainty, I answered them. Everyone loves someone. Many don't have a problem loving themselves, but those who do, myself included, do love someone, either family, friends, partners. There are those in your life that you love with your whole being. For those people, the message is reversed. Love yourself as you love your neighbor. All the grace, all the comfort, all the good things that you would afford your loved ones, you must also allow yourself. And this is the love that Christ would have me give my neighbor. And I may not have planted a seed of faith in my coworkers, that's between them and God, um, but I do know that I received a spark of hope that night. So that even years later, when I hear this passage afresh at Cornerstone Fellowship, and my mind immediately goes to that dark place where I have no love for myself. I have an answer to give, and I have love to provide. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I don't know um, if it's necessary or 
important what I think or say after that. I thought that was a very vulnerable and wise thing to say, but just in case it helps, I think that's a very wise insight into that scripture uh, for, for what it's worth, and I'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> so we're, um, well, I'm, I'm going to do something I don't usually do. Uh, it, we're still in Romans, um, and uh, we're at Romans 11, if you're following along. And I'm going to skip Romans 11, sort of. I'm going to touch upon it here briefly. I don't usually do that. As you know, when I preach through a book, I usually go, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I assure you I'm not skipping anything because it's too controversial or because it's, I, I don't know, nothing like that. Um, Romans chapter 11 deals largely with the, the relationship between Gentiles and Jews in the church. And while uh, while there is some things to be said about this, which I'm sorry to say in a moment, I don't think it's, um, th this is not as burning a question as it was back in the first century AD for the, for the, the new church uh, that was, of course, initially Jewish uh, and started to gather more and more Gentile believers. And there was this tension culturally, religiously, everything. Um, we're just not in that place. Um, and so there's, I think some things in that passage would simply be redundant for us and not real, not terribly relevant. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm just going to give that a miss right now. But I will, I did want to, st I'll say this, I have something I want to say about that with regard uh, to Judaism and, and our faith and whatnot. And it's in this uh, passage here, Elizabeth, if you could put the, that up. Uh, this, this is a verse from Romans 11. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the rich root of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. Uh, now, this, of course, is, is a metaphor uh, with regard to Judaism and the Gentiles, Gentiles meaning uh, people who are not Jewish. And basically, it says that the Gentiles, uh, people like myself, who are not ethnically Jewish, are grafted into uh, the, the, the tree of Judaism, if you will. Now, so what I want to say about this is that we are uh, essentially Jews, uh, those of us who call Christ our Savior and our Messiah, that we are, uh, we are Jewish. And I think it is helpful for us as a church, as a people, uh, to think of ourselves as, as a part of the Jewish faith. That is how the early church saw itself, as, as Jews, uh, because they either were Jews, uh, ethnically speaking, or they were non-Jews who saw themselves as being grafted into Judaism, as this uh, passage shows. Um, that, that they, you know, they came to believe that God, that there was one God, and it was the God of, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, and that from the Jews came salvation, as, as Jesus says in the John's Gospel. And so salvation is from the Jews, and it was not to say that the Jewish people can save anyone any more than any group of people can save any other group of people, but rather the God who chose them revealed to them uh, the, the nature of truth, uh, the nature of our sinfulness, uh, the nature of how, uh, well, uh, to use Elizabeth's example, the nature of how deeply we are loved by God, um, particularly in the person of Jesus Christ, this is exhibited. So I, I think we should think of ourselves as, as Jewish. Now, there is no need to be polemical or argumentative about it or dispute with people over this. Um, you know, if you have friends or loved ones uh, who are Jewish, ethnically or religiously or both, uh, this is not a hill to die on. <laughs> you don't, uh, you know, you don't uh, march into someone's house and declare yourself to be Jewish. I mean, there's just, that's not a, a battle to be fought. Um, but I think it's a helpful thing to keep in your mind uh, and to remember, uh, because for one thing, if historically the church had held on to this identity as Jewish, uh, anti-Semitism could never have taken root in the church like, like it did. And for another, it reminds us, teaches us, um, that the Old Testament, uh, which I tend to prefer to call the Hebrew Bible, so it doesn't sound like it's archaic or, or done with, uh, that the Hebrew Bible is, is as much a part of the gospel as, as the New Testament, as the Greek Bible, uh, that the Hebrew Bible explains as much about Jesus in some ways as, as the New Testament does, and it's all a piece. It's all, it's all, 
a unified whole. But that's another sermon. So that's all I wanted to say uh, about that. So we're going to start now in, in Romans uh, 12, start, uh, verse 1. We're approaching, uh, getting towards the, the final, uh, Paul's final thoughts in Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, this is one of my favorite topics to expound upon lately, and I have a, a small apology uh, for those of you who've been uh, faithfully attending the Wednesday night Bible studies, we did a whole Bible study on discerning the will of God, and you're going to hear a little repetition uh, in this sermon. I'm not going to tell the same jokes. I, I will spare you that, uh, but you're going to hear some overlap here, although hopefully you'll hear some new things too. How to find the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, um, as it happens, and it really was as it happens, it's not just something I'm inventing for the sake of a sermon point. Uh, one of my children asked me in the car uh, this week uh, something along the lines of how I know, how I personally know uh, when to do something, you know, if it's God's will or not, uh, or when to take a certain action. And I dare say that is not just a question that children ask of their parents, but that's a parents that it's a question that parents ask of their parents and, and of their God. How do I know uh, what God's will is? And I was able to explain uh, to my children that I don't actually spend much time worrying about this or being concerned about finding the will of God or missing the will of God. It's not a primary concern of mine, which I think is part of the good news. And I'll explain. I think the answer is right here in this passage before us. Because my focus, rather, is largely more on who I am becoming, or you might say my concern or, or, or whatnot, on who I am more than what I am doing. And what I want to know is, am I being transformed every day more into the likeness of God? which is to say God's character, not, of course, his power or knowledge, but am I becoming more Christ-like in the way that I relate to people and to the world? Or am I being transformed by something else in this world? You know, because transformation is what we do, right? That's, that's what we do. Uh, we do it through the, the course of our life, from birth to death. We are always changing. And it's not just our bodies that change, it's also our spirit and our character and how we think about things. And, you know, you will go to bed tonight a slightly different person than the person who got out of bed this morning. You will be slightly changed. Actually, if something dramatic happens to you, you might be significantly changed, but at the very least, you'll be slightly changed. My character today, the person I am at age 45, is as different from my 18-year-old self as my body is different from my 18-year-old self. I like to think that one of these things has improved over the years and that the other has declined rather alarmingly, especially in the past couple of years, and I'll let you figure out which is which. Now, the Lord does not want you to spend... I am fully convinced of this from not just this biblical passage, but others. I don't have time to, to do a full exegetical work, but the Lord does not want you to spend a significant portion of your life trying to winnow out what God's will is. I think that is a waste of time. That is a fool's game, like a game of hide and seek, you know, that, that God has made where you have to guess or, or, or find ways to make God show you uh, what the answers are. And it seems to me that sometimes we, we make the mistake, and I've done it too, uh, that we make the mistake of thinking that spirituality and spiritual living is kind of like those escape rooms that, that people make. You know, you're given a, a certain amount of time to solve a, a number of clues in order to get out of the room or figure out the puzzle, you know, whatever it is. 
you know, that on this view, God has put clues all throughout your life about what you should do. And if you miss those clues, or you don't solve them quickly enough, uh, then you've missed out on God's blessing. You should have turned left and you turned right, and oh, that's too bad. You know, there, there went God's blessing. And so to live like this, you know, you start to think that, uh, you know, every dream, every coincidence, every, everything has this divine significance, and, and, and it has to play out in your life somehow. And I think of this as being spiritual FOMO. Um, if you're familiar with the term FOMO, uh, it's, it's been around a few years now. It's fear of missing out. It's an acronym, fear of missing out, FOMO. And uh, Laura and I sometimes joke about our, uh, we occasionally catch about a FOMO the same way you might catch a cold or something that somewhere out there, someone's having a good time and we're not there, right? <laughs> That's how the, the term is usually used, you know, keeping up with the Joneses in terms of your social life, that, you know, somewhere people are having fun and you're not there. Uh, usually we think of the Petersons because usually that's true. Um, but uh, there, there's, there's a spiritual aspect to this. FOMO expresses itself spiritually, this innate anxiety that if we're not careful, we're going to miss out on things. It's a human experience. And, you know, entire mystical systems are built upon spiritual FOMO. I'm thinking particularly of things like astrology, divination, uh, even fortune cookies may be a, a more silly example, but all these things are, are, are you know, the, the ways that we handle our spiritual FOMO. We want to know what to do, when to do it, so as to maximize our enjoyment, our safety, and, and you know, perhaps more admirably, uh, to maximize our, our worth in the kingdom or to maximize our nearness to God. You know, it can be good things that, we, that we're wanting. But in the end, it's anxiety and a kind of silliness because we think that God is trying to tell us to do something and we aren't hearing it or aren't seeing it. And that's the ticket, that's the key, that's the, the, the thing where we know we've stumbled into unbiblical or heretical views, that any time we think of God trying to do something, trying to do something and not being able to do it, uh, we've wandered into a very dangerous area biblically. If God wants to tell you something, he will tell you. I, I am fully convinced of this. He is not a mute God like some idols. <laughs> he is not silent. He's perfectly capable of telling you what it is he needs to tell you. And you will know if you are being disobedient to that message. Uh, you will be like Jonah headed out to Tarshish. You will, you, will, you will absolutely know what you were told and absolutely know that you are running away. You don't have to worry about not hearing it. Now, how do I know this? Why do I say this so with such certainty, not just on the basis of this passage or others, but because God has spoken to me and to many of you, and I know you have your testimonies too. I have heard God speak to me clearly, not audibly ever. Some of you have had that experience. I never have. And by my count, uh, he's spoken to me, at least that I can recollect. I was trying to think, what are the, how many times has God spoken to me clearly? I knew it was God, and that this is what, you know, he was telling, to, telling me. And depending on uh, if my memory is clear or not, 10 or 11 times um, in the course of my life. In the course of 45 years, I've, I've heard God speak to me roughly 10 times. Usually it's a dream, although dreams from the Lord are, are, are so clear. When they're from the Lord, they're so clear and unambiguous, I tend to think of them as more like a vision than a dream. I may be sleeping, but it feels like a vision. I'm sure some of you know uh, of what I'm talking about there. One time, and I wanted to share this story in a bit more detail, just as by way of example of God speaking, one time it was the written word. And I meant to bring it here with me, actually. I left it at my desk at home. But it's just an you know, eight and a half by 11 page. And on the top in bold, it says dream. And then there's a text that goes down the length of the page, typewritten text. And it was a dream, but it wasn't my dream. In June of 2008, I was a youth pastor at, at New Covenant Fellowship, and I took uh, seven or eight of, of the youth group kids out to Seattle uh, for a trip to L'Arche, uh, a community for people with, with disabilities out there, 
uh, to visit L'Arche and to get something of that experience. And uh, we, because we were in the Pacific Northwest, we decided to go to a cabin and rent some cabins out in the woods and, and sort of appreciate the, the forests and the mountains. And we, we stayed there overnight and we piled into the cars to go. And I, I remember I started the engine with the key and we were pulling out of the cabins and somebody comes running out of the cabin, uh, somebody I didn't know, somebody I had never met. And uh, she handed me this sheet and it said dream on the top. And she said, um, the, the co-owner of the cabin, someone who was inside had this dream last night and she thought it was for you. And she thought I, I should have this, you know, right there in front of the, the kids and my wife and everyone. And I'm like, okay, you're crazy. <laughs> That's all right. I'll just take that. And I've already settled the bill. So I'm leaving now. And th that really is what I thought. I thought, okay, that some, well, uh, then I read the paper. Um, and, and the details were just astounding uh, to me. I mean, for one thing, uh, the, the, the dream was, a, the, the metaphor throughout the page was that of a colicky baby that you can't calm, a colicky baby that you can't nurse uh, into calmness or, 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 or uh, comfort in any way. And the person had no way of knowing that that would have been my experience. Amelia was just um, a few months old at this point, seven or eight months old. And our first couple months of parenting was one of colic, uh, which if you've been through it, it's just a, uh, it's just a, a lower tier of hell as far as I'm concerned. That nothing more miserable in my life I've ever been through um, than a baby who screams through the night and can't. But the, so this dream was all about how I had been given a ministry that I thought I could do. In this case, you know, the youth ministry, and that I had that I thought I had all the requisite gifts, the right formula, the right all the things to take care of the baby, uh, but that I wouldn't be able to do it, even though I had these particular gifts, that it wasn't for me. And then the dream said to wait on the Lord, and that something would come, not, not to get ahead of the Lord's will, it said that specifically, but something would come that was new and different, but that not to be concerned uh, that, th that this ministry was not one that I could do very well. That was a tremendous word of comfort for me, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, and it was very clear, and there were other things in it, but I um, I'll move on. But that, to me, that was the Lord speaking very clearly to me. And I, of course, still have that sheet of paper to remind me that God speaks. To, uh, sometimes he'll give someone else a dream for someone else. Why? I don't know, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> if I find it spiritually enjoyable, that uh, God can speak through any of us uh, to anybody else. So when God wants to speak to you, he will, and you will know that it is him. But you do, not, you do not need, we do not need God to speak to us to know what God's will is. Uh, we all know what God's will is. It's not an Easter egg that's hidden somewhere. It's right here in this passage. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is God's will. To give your whole self to God, because God is merciful, to give your whole self to the Lord as a living sacrifice, to concern ourselves with becoming holy, to concern ourselves with being pleasing to God, to, to, to study the scriptures, to consider his ways, to prayerfully walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This is your true and proper worship. This is the will of God. It doesn't matter it doesn't matter to me, it shouldn't matter to you. Whether or not you went to college, it doesn't matter if you graduated from high school. I couldn't care less if you became a tradesman or a professor, or if you never settled on a career at all. I don't care if you have children or not, or if you are married or not. I don't care if you're single and wish you had a partner, if you're married and wish you'd never gotten married. Now. I care in an emotional sense when I know you personally, you know, I care about these things in the way that I care about people. I want you to be happy and I want you to, you know, to, to have the desires of your heart and these kinds of things. But as, as a pastor and maybe even as something more, as, as a Christian, I kind of don't care. 
That's not what I care about the most, anyway. I care about whether or not you're being transformed day by day into the image of God. I do care about whether or not you've laid down your pride and your ego and your will on the altar before God. Your whole body is what the scripture says. Laid your whole self on the altar as a living sacrifice. I care about that. I care about whether or not I'm doing that. I care about whether or not when you call the Lord the Lord, is that just a title or is that an accurate description of your relationship with God? Is he really your Lord? This is the will of God. This is what it means to know the will of God. This is, it's, it's like the parable of the, of the prodigal, right? You know, if one of my children were to lead a life of wanton carelessness, you know, following, at least in the footsteps of their father initially, in the first part of my life, only living for themselves, hurting others callously because of their uncaring nature, and, and they, they, they get an, a terrible reputation. But in the end, like the prodigal child, they set it all aside and repent and give their whole life to the Lord as a living sacrifice, then my heart as a parent is at peace. And what I've cared about the most has come to pass. They would know and follow the will of God. And in a like manner, if another child of mine lives a life of prudent choices and wise living and goes to the right colleges or whatever, I don't know, builds a respectable reputation, well-liked by all, but they drift away from the Lord and they lead their whole life in a self-directed and self-concerned fashion, then I am brokenhearted because my child did not know the will of the Lord or chose not to follow it. And that's what matters. And that's all that matters. And that's my point. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, the next part of what I'm going to say is probably the hardest part to say, just because it's hard to articulate, not because it's, uh, it's just hard to articulate. And th that is this. I think as Christians, you know, we, it is not always the most pious and holy thing to always be going to the Lord in prayer. And I, I know that's not going to be a common theme of sermons around Champaign-Urbana today, <laughs> but it is not always the most pious and holy thing to always be going to the Lord in prayer for every choice and every decision and everything that comes before you. We are meant to live a life of unceasing prayer, and I've talked about that in a previous sermon, and what that means, what that looks like, what it means to live a life of a life that is one long prayer, in essence, one long conversation with God. But often it's, it's just, you know, to follow the will of your heart, if you've given your life to Christ, is what God wants you to do. I, I, I could have quoted a lot of passages here, but one that came to mind, and it's not on the screen, but in uh, 1 Chronicles 17, the conversation that Nathan has with David about building the temple, because David indicates to Nathan, King David indicates to, to Nathan that he uh, is interested in building a temple. And Nathan tells him, the, the, you know, the, the priest of the Lord, do whatever your heart tells you to do. It basically, he says, do what you want to do. Uh, you know, you're a man, the implication being you're a man who's given to the Lord, and if it's on your heart, then do it. And this actually proves both of my points, because then God says to Nathan unambiguously that very night, he sends uh, Nathan a dream, and he says, David is not to be the one to build my temple. Tell him not to do it. And later we find out it's because uh, David is a man too familiar with violence, too enamored with violence. Uh, but, you know, it, it encompasses both of these things. In a more personal way, just as a church, I, I could give thousands of examples, but uh, as a church, we give a, a sum of money every month uh, to see you at home, the homeless ministry here in town. We've done that for years. Why do we do that? Do we receive a specific message or a dream or something from the Lord that we needed to do that? 
Uh, no, or at least I didn't. Um, we did it because our faith, our intellect, came to the conclusion in, in conjunction with one another that we should do that. We looked and we saw that there was a need for a homeless shelter in Champaign-Urbana. We looked and we saw that brothers and sisters in Christ were working on making this happen. And we knew it was in keeping with biblical principles to tend to the least among us, uh, to the poor in our community. And so we decided that we would do it because it seemed right and good to us. I never once felt like God was saying to me like a message or in a dream, this is what you should do. And in fact, 99.9% .9 of my life, and I suspect of yours as well, it is like it's just you just do what seems best to you. And so the most important thing is going to be who are you, <laughs> right? Because just think of it from God's point of view, if we can, if we can deign to do, do such a thing, humbly, if we can here for a minute. What if God had sent us a message, a dream, a letter saying you should give money every month to see you at home? And we did it obediently, but our hearts weren't really in it. We didn't really care that much about it, but we just did it because God was telling us to do it. That wouldn't mean quite as much to God, right? Because our hearts aren't in it. You know, we don't feel that compassion for, for the homeless out there that God feels. We're not on the same page. So I give up many such examples. But, you know, it, it's, it's a bit of a dangerous thing, a bit of a dangerous thought but I think an important and vital one uh, to, 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 to realize that God is building you up into something. Uh, that word telos in the Greek, uh, T-E-L-O-S, which means complete or perfect. He's working on completing you, perfecting you, so that your character and your heart are in tandem with God's heart, so that you will be able to discern what God's perfect will is by who you are, not by messages although God is perfectly capable of sending you a message and will from time to time, in my experience, if you're walking with him. So that's, that's my, that's my uh, speech on the will of God from, from this passage. And I find it to be a very freeing thought that if I'm walking with the Lord and trying to be more like Christ, that I don't have to worry about missing the boat, that I don't have to worry that I stepped outside of his will in some way. Now, the next part of this passage, and i run a little bit low on time here, I'll um, I think on with this. This actually gets a bit into what Elizabeth was talking about at the beginning. And Paul goes on to say, you know, dis discern what God's will is by virtue of, of who you are, uh, by making yourself a spiritual sacrifice. And then he says, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So I think that's a good image of, 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 how, of what, you know, to, to these two passages together. Hand over your life as a spiritual sacrifice. Give your will to the Lord. And then think with sober judgment about everything, not just about uh, who, who you are in relation to other people, but to think with sober judgment, to use the, you know, you use the heart and mind that God gave you, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And I do think, just to put an exclamation point on it, I think what Elizabeth said is very insightful, because when we think about ourselves with sober judgment, the first truth of the Bible, the first one, is that God made you in his image, and cares about you. That's the first truth of the Bible, that you have value and worth, that you are loved. That is the first truth. Then we can get into the second truth of our brokenness and our sin, and that's a vital truth too. But if you just jump right into the brokenness and the sin without acknowledging that first truth, then you're not thinking with sober judgment about who you are, at least not from a biblical point of view. You're just grasping the negative. And so to think of ourselves with sober judgment, yes, absolutely. 
not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And I dare say that is the, the bulk of, of human temptation uh, that I see in the world, is to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. But Elizabeth points out there's a, a corollary. There's another temptation to think of ourselves as more lowly than we ought, right? Both being temptations in their own regard. And we should think of ourselves with sober judgment of people of tremendous worth, tremendous value, such that God would go to the cross and die for us. And yet we are people of such sin and brokenness that we can do nothing on our own without the Holy Spirit working within us. I think I'll end there. I've got a, a bit more, but I think I've, I've said enough for one day. <laughs> Let me uh, I'll go to our time of communion, and Jean-René will uh, bless us with a song, but let me pray us into communion here. Lord Jesus, I am just struck again by the, uh, the freedom uh, that your word brings when we trust it, when we study uh, this, this book uh, that Paul wrote uh, so many years ago, and, and the ways that it unlocks the gates in our hearts and allows us to lay down in front of you, laying down our burdens, laying down our fears and our anxieties, and say, not my will, Lord, but yours. And knowing, Lord, that you do hold us tightly in your grip. And Lord, I do pray as we go to your table, uh, as your scripture commands us, and, and as Elizabeth encouraged us this morning, that we would think of ourselves with sober judgment, accepting the, the profound love that you offer us on the cross, and also accepting our sinfulness, which is why you went to the cross. Lord, meet us at the table. And when we go to bed tonight, Lord, may we be changed that much more into who you are. Amen. Come home, oh, earnest 
the tenderly Jesus is calling, calling all oh sinner, come home, calling all oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised. Promise for you and for me. Though we have sinned, He has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling all sinner, come.